So environmental initiative kind of, it, I think it better reflects the, the path that, that we see moving forward in trying to, to reach out and, and solve a lot of the complex uh, environmental problems that we all share in our face. Um, and to do that, we really rely on collaboration. So there's a lot of nonprofits um, in the state, there's a lot of environmentally focused nonprofits in Minnesota. And I think what makes environmental initiative a little different is our focus on collaboration. We, we do everything through partnerships and working together, uh, bringing a lot of diverse perspectives to the table to figure out uh, collaborative solutions to more of the complex kind of issues that we're facing environmentally. And that's really fundamental to um, EI at its core and in our approach in all of the work that we do. And historically, I think, and even moving forward into the future, I think that that is really the way to, to achieve the gains that we're looking for in environmentally, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's waste and recycling, whether it's health of ecosystems and, and people. Um, I think really bringing together some cross-sector insights, some private, public, um, nonprofit, business, government, bringing all of those folks together to, to think about how we address some of these issues is the most important and most impactful way to I think too that environmental issues um, have a history of being a bipartisan priority in our region, here in Minnesota in particular, because we're a state that loves our, our clean water, our clean air. Um, we have a, an abundance of resources here that I think Minnesotans we all enjoy and we value deeply. Um, and it, it doesn't, those resources, those things that we have in abundance of here in Minnesota, they don't have to come at um, at the detriment of business either. There are a lot of ways that business and the environment can really work together and all of the players that are involved in these cases can collaborate to make sure that we have um, the same kind of resources, the same kind of um, environment that we have today for the future. So, Environment for us doesn't have to be a bipartisan issue, it doesn't have to be a political issue at all, it's just something that we all value. We look forward to working with anybody from any background, any business, any nonprofits, um, to truly really figure out how we can work together to, to solve some of these problems. So that's really where EI comes in, that's really our warehouse is bringing those voices together. Um, and that's actually what really brought me to environmental leadership. I've actually been with the organization for only about two years now. Um, I came from my previous work was really focused on business sustainability, so really working individually with businesses, small and large, on helping them do the things that they could do within their own four walls, within their footprint, to be more sustainable. But what drew, drew me to environmental initiatives was this bigger vision. So we can do so much more if we collaborate with a lot of people. And 
And that's what I'm going to talk mostly about tonight, and I'll show you a few examples of, of what got me here, and I think is what keeps the environmental initiative uh, relevant and, and really moving forward in the right direction. <coughs> Um, anything else I can say about environment? I think I think that covers most of our background. Um, I want to touch on a few examples of this work. I'll say collaboration. I'll say partnership. I'll say a lot of that stuff over and over again because it really is at the core of our work, um, and it really is one of our, our true values. And um, in I think maybe in in thinking about the way that we approach our work and using collaboration as a tool, there's a few examples of, of how we do that, how we actually get the work done through these partnerships. I think there's a lot of ways that that happens, but maybe a few more specific examples are gathering input. So we work with a lot of different um, stakeholders to design sessions or research projects to really um, try to determine, you know, generate ideas, um, and, and really gather input from diverse stakeholders to, to figure out um, what's needed to make decisions, to guide policies, to guide programs. We also build consensus, so a major thing of, of bringing people together is trying to get them all to find common ground. So we, we're expert facilitators and conveners where we bring a lot of different stakeholders together to find common ground and develop uh, plans that are mutually beneficial. And we're really out in focus. So we do all of that with the goal of trying to produce outcomes that are valuable to the environment. Um, we do this in a lot of different ways. We have work in the, in the realm of policy. We're not an advocacy organization by any means, but we understand that a lot of environmental issues will require some sort of policy interaction. So we have policy-related work. We have programmatic work. Um, we have events. We have um, different opportunities to bring together a wide variety of different people, whether it's practitioners in business, government, nonprofit leaders, or the general public just to come together and learn more and share best practices over different issues. So I'm going to touch on just a few of these examples of, of how we do some of this work. Um, I'll breeze through a couple real quickly, and then I'll spend most of my time on, on the circular economy component that, that Doug mentioned. So one example in our, our policy space of the work that we do um, is the climate solutions and economic opportunities work that happened um, here throughout the states of Minnesota, just wrapped up last year, um, at least this stage of the work. Um, and it's a, a project that was really led by the Minnesota um, Environmental Quality Board. Um, and the role that environmental initiative played was really gathering stakeholders to provide more input on process on the potential results um, and all of, all of the impacts. So what we did was we supported that as CZO, I was about to say it, CZO is how we typically refer to it. In nonprofits, there's so many acronyms, so there's an acronym for everything. Um, so I, I apologize if I throw out a few acronyms without explaining what they are. But climate solutions and economic opportunities commonly referred to as CZO. It doesn't really make sense, but it's close. Um, but what we did for the, the CZO process was really convening a series of meetings to get that stakeholder input. So we started with a large kickoff event to, to really identify who was interested and what they thought about the, the process. Um, we had working sessions for six different distinct sectors um, to provide some of that input. And then we also had a final wrap-up event to kind of include all of the information, share the findings, and, and feed it into the final report. And all of this was to inform decisions for the state on actions that can really help us with our greenhouse gas emissions. So the goal is to find ways to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And the final report went to the EQB, which is the Minnesota Environmental Quality Board, um, and we compiled organize, analyze all the notes and submit it to them to, to help them um, with their process and with their, their solutions on the back end. Another example of our work is Clean Air Minnesota. This is a more of a project-based uh, it's more of a project-based program um, that involves a lot of different partners uh, and it's been going on for over 10 years now. Um, back in 2001 
is when Clean Air Minnesota really kind of started, and it was because we were facing for the first time really in Minnesota some real air quality issues. We had our first smog alerts happening. Um, we were really close to exceeding federal uh, air quality guidelines, and this scared everybody because this, is, this doesn't happen in Minnesota. So a really diverse group of partners, public, private, nonprofit, and business, um, came together, coalesced around this idea of trying to create solutions to bring, to increase our air quality again without the need for regulation, without the need for mandates. It could be good, bad, or, or other for the business community in particular. And what came out of that was Clean Air Minnesota. And this group has ever since been dedicated to finding ways, new strategies to really increasing the quality of our, our air here in Minnesota in the metro area, but also statewide. Um, and it's really, again, through based on partnerships with a lot of different entities and, and ultimately with a lot of collaboration. And Clean Air Minnesota, it's, it's a large program and there's a lot of projects that are going on and a lot of projects that have happened over the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, but here's a couple just real quick concrete examples of, of the work that we're doing within Clean Air so that, um, and again, I should also say that this program is all volunteer. It's not none of none of this is is being forced by any entity. There isn't any regulation saying that we need to to have some sort of program like this because our air quality is at an unreasonable level. This is all the different partners coming together saying we can do this, it makes business sense, it makes sense for our health and wellness and for the environment if we just try to address these over time so that we don't get into a place where we suddenly need some sort of intervention or regulation. And a great example is Project Green Fleet. So this has been around, um, I believe, for eight or nine years now. Um, and it started as a, a program to retrofit school buses throughout the state, um, retrofit their engines to reduce the particulate matter that went off the tailpipe. And over the course of eight years or so, we've successfully retrofitted every bus in Minnesota that made sense to retrofit, so not counting ones that were being retired. Um, and since doing all of those buses, we've moved to other diesel engines, heavy equipment, big machinery. Um, and so far to date, we've been able to retrofit 4,600 diesel vehicles across the state which is air quality equivalent of about 750,000 cars being removed from the road annually. So it's significant mm -hmm. um, just in the particular reductions um, from, this, from these retrofit equipments. Mm -hmm. And that's still a pro project that's ongoing. Um, project Snowswap is a new example. It's the, yeah. Sam, just a quick question. I, I know there's a, a lot of work going on right now was the money coming from Volkswagen mm -hmm. with electric buses? Are you guys involved with that project too? Yeah, well, we certainly hope to be. So there's, as you probably all have heard, there's a huge settlement that has come down from VW, from Volkswagen, and every state in the, in the country is getting some allocation of funds that's going to be, they're still deciding on how all of that money gets spent and what it gets spent on. Um, the state of Minnesota, I forget the exact number, but it's a huge number, 40 some billion yeah. over the course of 10 years. Um, and there's, there's, they're setting up right now, the PCA is setting up a process for how that money gets distributed and for what. I think a major component of it will go to, well, there's, there's two kind of main charges within it. There's electric vehicles and then there's also uh, diesel emission reduction, similar to what Project Green Fleet is doing. And we don't know exactly how the allocation will be appropriated yet, and who will participate, and where they get spent, but we absolutely hope that Project Green Fleet is a great example of something that can continue to use that kind of funding to reduce our emissions. Um, and being kind of a leader in the state as far as programs like that, I would anticipate that we'll have a, a prominent role in some of that. Just to briefly follow up, and so did the environmental initiative participate in any of the PCA meetings and, and make comments to this? Yes, so so I should clarify that I don't actually work on Clean Air Minnesota or Project Green Fleet. So 
I, I know a little bit about where we're at and what we're doing, but um, Bill Dressler, he's the, the head of the Clean Air Minnesota program at Environmental Administration. He's been the one that's been participating in a lot of the PCA hearings. He's been tracking all of the DW settlements um, in <coughs> and EV and the, the diesel uh, emission reduction work. So yes, the short answer is yes, but I can't tell you all of what what we have participated in and exactly where some of that process is, is, is at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Project Stove Swap is a newer example. It's the same kind of concept of Project Green Fleet, except for it's focused on stoves. And it's focused mostly on uh, greater Minnesota, where there's a, a large portion of the population that heats their, their homes with wood, wood stoves and wood furnaces. So this program um, is similar because we, we help uh, families, homes, businesses, nonprofits replace their old inefficient wood burning stoves with high efficient, low emitting um, uh, options instead. So not only do we increase their efficiency, but again, reduce, uh, reduce particulate emissions and, and help our, our air quality overall. This program just launched uh, last month, actually, so we're just starting to get our first round of applications in. Um, but we do know that for every swap out, so every new efficient stove that we put in is the equivalent of taking about 700 cars off the road annually. So it may seem kind of strange, it may seem kind of small of a wood stove that's heating a house, but the particulate matter that goes out is, is pretty significant. So swapping those out with efficient options is really helpful. Um, and we're also partnering with state uh, retailers and manufacturers to help also make sure that a lot of the, the money that is spent on the new equipment is also here in the Minnesota economy, which is great. And then the last Clean Air Minnesota example that I'll touch on is a Clean Air Assistance Project. And it's the same kind of concept, but it's more focused on small businesses. So dry cleaners, auto body shops, um, small businesses, particularly around the metro area, that have uh, equipment or processes that emit a lot of pollutants, um, particularly ones that will be harmful for air quality. Uh, we have assisting uh, both financial and technical assistance to help retrofit some of those processes to make them cleaner um, and safer and more affordable as well. And I think the thing to know about all of these projects, kind of like what I might have started by saying, is it really requires partnerships. All of those are examples of um, business partnering with nonprofits, partnering with government entities to make sure it happens. Financial incentives to, move, to pay for the equipment come from a variety of those different sources, and outreach and engagement happens through all of the different partners as well. So then, the, the thing that I'm here to talk the most about, and the thing that I actually know more about, because this is something I work on, uh, is the Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition. And this is a relatively new effort at the Environmental Initiative. Um, and this is the effort that's focused on, on this circular economy concept that I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. Um, but this is a collaboration of now 33 different unique members, and you'll see all of their logos up here right now, primarily business and primarily the large businesses, the brands of, of Minnesota, but also some key nonprofits and public partners, um, and some smaller businesses as well. And this group of, of members came together um, because they, a lot of them had recognize that they've done a lot of the sustainability things that they can do on their own. They've, they've picked the low-hanging fruit, but they recognize that there's a much bigger opportunity if they come together and partner on bigger sustainability issues. So they, they came together thinking that they could drive kind of the next frontier of sustainability within business, and they focused that on the circular economy. Um, so I should say that the idea technically came around over two years ago. A smaller group of these businesses actually came to Environmental Initiative with this idea saying, we want to partner, we want to find a way to collaborate, we want to have a big impact, but we need some help. So they came to EI because EI is the convener in the space, and we've helped just to facilitate the conversations, make sure that they're on the right track, and really help them get their work done. And about a year ago, it was a year ago in February, 
we had our first official meeting of the coalition. At the time, we only had 24 members, so we've grown a little since then. Um, and in our first year, so up until February, just last month, we spent a lot of time just setting up the structure of what this coalition was, how they operate, how they work together, um, figuring out what their top priorities were and still are, and really identify some of the big ambitious goals that they have for working together, which is what I'll talk more about. Um, so why, why do businesses want to work together? <laughs> why why a coalition and why collaboration? I think that there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, but I think we've seen a few key drivers in the space. We've, we've seen a few key things that businesses keep saying is the reason why they want to work together on sustainability and in the coalition. And these are, these are some of the key ones, I think. Um, efficiencies are always important. They've always been important. But especially now more than ever, as, as resources are <coughs> constrained and um, costs continue to increase, efficiencies operationally are even more and more important. And the, if they can work together to find what those efficiencies are and maximize them, it's even more efficient. Um, supply chains, there's increasingly um, risk, there's a lot of risk throughout a lot of these different supply chains. So again, best practice sharing and understanding where the opportunities are um, decreases some of those risks. Natural resources I just mentioned, but they're not finite um, and they're not as cheap as they used to be. So how can we how can we work together to to ensure better resource use um, and better stewardship of our resources that will only benefit all of the businesses in the long term? Um, also changing customer preferences. So changes in the market itself and understanding what those are and how they're cross-sectoral will help each of these different members and different businesses um, address them and work together. And then leadership. I think businesses want to come together to demonstrate that Minnesota is a great place for business leadership. We have some incredible businesses and organizations doing incredible things here. Um, it really is a hub for sustainable economic growth. And by associating themselves in a coalition like this, we can only further that brand for our region as a great place to do sustainable work. So in response to some of these challenges and opportunities, that's why I think a lot of these businesses have come together um, to work through this coalition to try to, to create a more circular economy and um, a more stable system for, for our economic um, growth and gain. So I've danced around circular economy long enough, so it's time to, I guess, talk about it. And you're not going to figure it out from the slide, because the slide is admittedly, well, one, it's really small. I can't see a word, I'm sure. Um, but two, it's just really confusing. So I, I kind of like to start here, because it is a confusing concept at first. Um, and this is a good representation of confusion, I think. But this, uh, this image is actually taken from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a, one of the primary thinkers behind the circular economy right now. They're based in the UK or in England. Um, and they've done a lot of the research and, and uh, work behind identifying what we mean by circular economy. And even though you can't tell it from this diagram, a lot of what they they talk about is what Doug mentioned at the beginning of this cradle to cradle idea. It's really material based, so there is no waste. Anything that we have, anything that we produce, continues to serve purpose. It's either continues to be reused or it's recycled or it's reincorporated. So it never loses its value. If there is no trash, and that's right, and that's important. Um, but for the way that the, the Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition is thinking about the circular economy, it's that, but it's bigger than that. So it's even more holistic, where there is no waste at all. There is no waste in any component of our economic system. Um, way, material waste is included in that, but it also includes other things like energy production, um, ecosystems, the health and wellness of, of people, and so on and so on. And I'll touch more on that in a minute after we get off this confusing slide. But there's also an incredible amount of 
potential value of the circular economy. So this is, again, coming from um, some research that was in partnership with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but also with McKinsey & Company and um, the World Economic Forum. And they did this study a couple years ago and found that just when just considering the material aspects of our economic system, so again, just that there is no material waste, everything is reincorporated into new products, new resources, um, we could see over a trillion dollars of economic value by the year 2025 if we got into that sort of system. And that's just on the material side of things. So there's huge potential for businesses in particular to capitalize on a more circular system. Granted, it would take a lot of effort and a lot of input to get into that system, but if we can do it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay us dividends. So I said, um, with the coalition, we think about the circular economy is bigger than just materials. So this is kind of a snapshot of, of what the coalition, that group of 33 businesses has identified as being most important within the circular economy model. Um, and you'll see materials is in there, so I'll touch on that. But primarily, uh, the work that they focus on so far is around renewable energy. So within the circular economy, you can't you technically can't have a truly circular economy unless it's powered by 100% clean renewable energy. Because it's, it's fundamental. If, if you're burning coal or burning anything, if you're producing pollution while you're making energy, that's not circular. Pollution is waste. And the pollution not only is waste, but it's also contaminating other uh, natural resources that we have. So fundamentally, a truly circular economy has to be powered by 100% renewable energy. That's big, that's a lofty goal, we're not going to get there tomorrow, um, but that's the vision. Um, materials, like I already said, in a circular economy, you never throw anything away. There is no need for a landfill, there is no garbage incinerator because everything continues to serve a purpose, everything retains its value and keeps being reincorporated back into the economic system. Natural capital is also really important. <clears throat> Instead of just protecting our ecosystems, just protecting the environment, we're actually rebuilding our, our ecosystems. We're building natural capital. And that goes hand in hand with health, health people and communities. Um, in a really circular system, our people are healthy, they're well, we have an equitable society, um, and, and we're happy. <laughs> So these are, there's a lot of other other components that the coalition in particular has, has talked a lot about regarding the circular economy, but these are kind of the core principles that they're using as they as they think about how they work together. Could you could you um, speak about rebuilding natural capital again? I don't remember what you were saying there. Sure. That's just going to the idea of. All of our natural environment, all of our, our natural resources, the, the systems that we have, habitat, um, as well as community for us, making sure that we're not just incrementally protecting things, that we're actually working proactively to make sure our environment is, is safe and healthy, and we're actually rebuilding those ecosystems, we're rebuilding habitat. So it's, it's much more of a proactive approach to thinking about the natural world as opposed to just trying to minimize harm. We're being more proactive about making sure that we're producing the, the systems, the place that we really want to have, or that we should have. Altogether, it starts to sound like a, a leads program for systems, mm -hmm. you know, for um, Minnesota Green Star, for an economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, I definitely think it could be led to that and a lot of other kind of certifications, systems. And I think it's really important to know or to think about all of these are, are big, ambitious, lofty goals, and none of them will be easy. So it's important to think about it incrementally and how, how do we get to that place where something is pretty circular. Um, and there's a lot of things kind of like a lead system where you, you work through the different criteria to, to get up to an ultimate goal. How do we start to build some of these different elements to be a little more circular? to start to bend the arrows a little bit 
to ultimately over time create this, this more of a utopia of, of something that really, our economic system that really reflects our natural systems. So in fact, the, the process reflects that Chinese proverb of the travel on a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's something that's really important too is the coalition, that group of 33 businesses, is they, they recognize that this is not an easy thing and it is incremental and that they're committed not only to Minnesota and staying here and being a part of the community, but also to building out some of these aspects, which is pretty, pretty ambitious and pretty incredible, really, for, for a lot of those companies. So all of that, all of that kind of background um, feeds into the overall vision of the Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition, which is here. And it's really focused on using collaboration between themselves and with a whole variety of other partners to, to build out this more thriving circular economic system um, and focusing on the healthy environment and sustainable growth. Because like I said before, they don't have to be in conflict with each other. We can still grow economically in the circular system. It's just a better way to do it. So with our vision, we also have a mission um, that really again focuses on that collaboration and focuses on regional growth and competitiveness for the businesses. <clears throat> and this is more speaking to what they actually plan to do together. So it's all been theoretical now, but what are they actually going to do? So there are three main um, priorities for the work in general that they want to accomplish. Number one is, is new projects. When they started this coalition, they didn't want to have it just be an opportunity to, to pat themselves on the back and say, hey, we're doing a great job already. They really want to start new things together. They want to make a difference. So number one priority from day one has been to identify some projects and actions Projects isn't even necessarily the right, the right word. It's just, they can take a variety of different actions that make us start to bend those areas, get us closer to that more circular model. Uh, but that's that's what they want to do. They want to do things together to make a difference. But they also want to do the two other things. Um, to get there, to, to understand how they can build a more circular economy, they have to, they have to kind of identify it. So some of their work is actually in in building out what the circular economy really means, what it looks like, what our what our role is as a as a coalition, what others' roles can be, how we can all work together, and then also telling our story, um, not only of this work and of building a circular economy, but also the story of, of the leadership that all of these organizations have already demonstrated to share what they have done, what they know, and really encourage other businesses here regionally, but also around the world, potentially, to, to join us in this, in this big effort. So, I said projects or actions are kind of the top priority, and they, they always have been. But then, when you think about this giant circular model that I just briefly tried to explain, that, it, that includes everything. So how, how can this group of 33 businesses do everything? Also knowing that we can't actually create a circular economy just in Minnesota. I mean, this is a global economy that we live in. There's, we can't just build up a wall and say we're going to do business only within the state, and that's it. It just doesn't work that way. So if we're thinking about a global economy, and we're thinking about a circular economy that incorporates all of the different aspects of, of a healthy, thriving um, place, where do we start? So they started by setting three main priorities for their actions together um, in the world of opportunity. And those three actions are on clean energy, which I'll talk more about, converting organic waste into resources. That gets to the real core material-based aspects of, of the circular economy. And then something we've called green grade infrastructure, um, which so far has really been focused on of uh, water cycles, water resources, reusing water, but ultimately it's both, it, the larger focus is on the built environment that we already have and trying to ensure that we're making the, the built environment as green and sustainable as possible to better reflect some of our natural systems. So helping 
having our infrastructure, our buildings, you know, recycle water and reincorporate into water systems. Um, a lot of those kind of aspects. Um, organic waste, that's a little more obvious. I mean, we have the compost bin in the back. It's the same kind of concept, but thinking about how can businesses have a bigger impact. So what's the highest value of all organic matter that we have? How can we capture that energy? How can we put it back to use? How can businesses collaborate to do that? <clears throat> and then energy, which is what I'll spend most of the rest of my time talking about, is, is the core of, of what they really have been focused on. And again, that gets back to the, the idea that a truly circular economy can't operate unless it's powered by 100% renewable energy. So when they started to, to do this work on energy in particular, this is the vision that they set up for themselves, which is, again, very lofty. I mean, we're not going to have, even just here in the state of Minnesota, we're not going to have our entire grid powered by 100% renewable energy next year. It's going to take a while to get there. But that's what they want to get to. And that's some of the largest <coughs> businesses in Minnesota saying we want to get there. So they've committed to this vision, which is very powerful in itself, <clears throat> and now they're working on ways and strategies that they can collaborate to start to get us in that direction. So again, that's still very big. So how do, how do we take this big opportunity and narrow it into something that we start with, what we focus on? So they, I mentioned that in year one, they really spent a lot of time setting these priorities, setting up the structure, figuring out how they work together. <clears throat> and now, just at the end of last year, in December of 2016, they officially adopted their first clean energy uh, work plan, which we're now beginning to execute in 2017. So it's still early in that process, but we're going to begin to, to work on the implementation side of some of those actions. So within that work plan, there's kind of really four different kind of key components of the work plan. One is really focused on renewable energy. So how do we bring more renewable energy online? How do we get access to more renewable energy, whether that's through new production privately through organizations and companies, or just getting more on the grid? So that's kind of their number one focus. And there's a few strategies that they've already, already identified that they want to try to pursue within that. There's also a, a keen focus on efficiency and performance of systems. So we don't want to just produce more renewable energy if we don't need more renewable energy. So let's try to be as efficient as we possibly can and then only need uh, the, only produce the, the amount of renewable energy that we really need. And they have some strategies of how they want to work together to start to accomplish that. Um, they also have a focus on increasing the electric, the electrification of different systems, starting with transportation. So we heard a little bit about uh, EVs at the beginning of this. Um, and the coalition wants to figure out how can they also help with that? How can we start to electrify our, our transportation? transportation system even more, and how can we actually demonstrate that Minnesota is a really strong market for electric vehicles, both through demand for the vehicles themselves, but also through a, a more complex, better integrated um, system, infrastructure, uh, recharging stations, all of that. And what role can businesses do in that? And then the, the fourth kind of key area within the clean energy work plan that they have for this year is really about collective voice. So they have a lot of these strategies of things that they want to try to do together, but they also see that as that group, as big businesses in particular, they have um, a pretty strong voice that they should share. So if they really think that we need to have 100% clean renewable energy for our system, they, they need to find ways to communicate that externally to policymakers, to lawmakers, to other businesses, um, to, to help encourage more to join this, this fight to, to in, increase our renewable energy standard, renewable energy access um, and resources. So we're still in the process of, I mentioned we, we adopted the work plan, but we're still in the process of trying to execute it. So right now, um, over the last two months since the beginning of the year, we've spent a lot of time finding where 
these groups of members are really interested. Who wants to work on these different projects? What the specifics of the projects are? How are we going to get started? And I hope that by even mid-year, we've actually had a few actions out there that, that are pretty public that people can see that this group of, of companies is really dedicated to this work, and they're starting to make some, some progress in that direction. So, I know I'm running out of time, so I think I'm nearly done. Um, so real quick, just what we've learned. So this is kind of a reflection not only on the coalition, which I spent most of my time talking about, but also just environmental initiative in general and all of the work that we do. Um, I think the key takeaway for the coalition and EI is, again, that, that collaboration is key. Like, there's no way that we can do any of the circular economy things that I was just explaining on ourselves, on, by ourselves, as a single organization, a single business, as a single individual. Fundamentally, we have to work together because it's a big goal and it's going to take a lot of inputs. Um, so what we've learned is we need to find a lot of points for collaboration. We need to find a lot of common ground and find common interests and find ways to work towards those common interests. We also need to find ways to develop champions, um, thought champions, implementation champions, voices that are out in the community. We need to develop those champions and give them the tools through collaboration to, to really make a difference, make an impact, and help build out some of these systems that we're talking about. And all of this goes to community building. Um, we have a strong, as I've said a couple times already, we have a really strong community here of environmental, environmentally thinking, environmentally forward um, people, businesses, organizations here in the state. And we need to continue to foster that community and build it even more. And ultimately, that, that supports the, the social communities that we have as well to build a better place for all of us and businesses um, jointly. And ultimately, what all of that means is we're better together. And better together is actually one of the, the key taglines that Environmental Initiative uses all the time. It's kind of one of our models. Is we can't do this work alone, and we're actually fundamentally better if we are all working together. So does that, was that motivating? Does that make you want to like start collaborating, get some more partnerships? I hope so. <laughs> So there are a lot of ways to get involved with environmental initiative. Um, I started this by mentioning a few of the events that we do. Um, we have an award ceremony every year. It's scheduled for March 25th of this year. And it's actually a, a unique one because it's our 25th anniversary. So it's going to be an even bigger celebration. But the awards, every year that we've done them, it's, um, it's just a really fun opportunity to, to recognize the people and the organizations doing strong environmental work throughout the state. There isn't a, a big pitch. There isn't a long um, keynote speaker. It's really about celebrating everybody who's, who's along on this journey and working towards uh, a better environment for Minnesotans. So, if you've never been to one, I would strongly encourage going. It's a great, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity to network with a lot of people that are involved in the field. Um, this year will be extra exciting just because it's the 25th anniversary. I can't say what we're going to do. I don't even know anything that we're going to do, but I know it's going to be fun. Um, Environmental Initiative also has a variety of different membership options, just more ways to get involved. Organizations, businesses can be members, and individuals can be members too. Um, and membership gives you a lot of different uh, resources, access to different things to do, and in particular gets you into all of our events at a discount rate. I mentioned that we have a lot of events throughout the year. Um, two of the most notable ones are a policy forum series that we do every year. So it's usually three or four different sessions where we talk about uh, pertinent policy issues that, are, that we're facing, and, and we bring in a variety of different experts and speakers to talk about those policies. Similarly, we have what we call the Business and Environment Series, which is more focused on kind of the practitioner side of environmental sustainability. So we pick different topics um, throughout the year. It's usually three different sessions throughout the year, and we bring together practitioners with 
business, government, nonprofit, and a lot of just people who are interested in the topic come and learn more and share best practices um, that. on that sustainability issue. We actually have, I think I wrote it down here, we have our next business and environment series sessionists. Uh, it just got scheduled and we just sent out our first notice today that registration is open. It's going to be on April 11th and it's going to be focused on sustainable work environment. So it's going to be more focused on the built environment um, and how we make sure that our buildings are healthy and supporting um, happy and productive workforces. But then also, we're just open for collaboration, obviously, because that's what I said about 50 times tonight. So we encourage everybody to bring ideas to us. We, we want to be a hub for creativity, collaboration, um, best practice sharing, all of that. And although we work a lot with businesses and government, we work with everybody. And that includes um, individuals, um, the general public, uh, small nonprofits, large groups, schools, churches, it doesn't matter. We, we want to we wanna build out this community even more. We want to find the best opportunity. So anybody who has ideas for things that, that should be addressed, especially if they should be addressed through this collaborative model, come to us and let us know. And we're always happy to, to look into it with you. So that's it. That's all I have. That's my presentation. And I'm happy to take any questions you guys might have. So far, has been in the Netherlands. Actually, um, they have a few a few different groups set up that are trying to work with similar things that, that we're working towards. Um, but they've been doing it for a little bit longer, for several years now, um, and they've actually set some goals and some priorities for different regions to how will they get there. Um, I think if you just I think it's just circle-economy.com is a, a link to one of those organizations in the Netherlands. They have a ton of research, a ton of information. Um, and them, along with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is in the UK, those are kind of the two main hubs for, for thought and practice so far. Yeah. Um, is there a plans, or do they have presently any kind of lobbying effort? Because, I mean, that seems like you've got such a thing that all small groups can ever begin to do. Um, uh, and uh, wondering, we've, um, recently we've had some just hideous um, uh, legislation regarding energy. So um, having corporations uh, trying to offset some of those would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes and no. Um, from day one, the coalition, when, when they started, they set some of their priorities and how they wanted to work together. They said that they do not want to be an advocacy organization. They don't want to, to lobby directly, but they they totally understand that there are policy implications with everything that they do. And because of who they are and the size and the weight that they, they carry, they recognize that they have to play in the policy space. So that's something that we're, we're trying to balance delicately. There's already been a lot of opportunities where members have, have uh, spoken directly to different committees of the State Chamber of Commerce, there have been several organizations and, and members, member companies that have gone to the legislature. Um, we've been active with other groups that do more direct advocacy work, and they've partnered with us on some of those kind of initiatives and, and priorities. Mostly, I think all around clean energy so far. I don't think we've actually taken any sort of stance on anything else yet. Um, so yes and no. I, we'll, that's going to increase. Um, in the near future, I think, in particular. Um, but I don't think that you'll see the coalition as a whole body lobbying or going down the Capitol Hill or anything like that. You'll see a lot of members speaking up because of the company that they are and referencing the coalition. Um, but he as a body won't be doing advocacy work. 
it's like I can imagine um, each company. Um, I saw all the utility companies or most of them around mm -hmm. here. Um, I can see a company es establishing a circular economy within itself. I can um, imagine like a 3M, you know, or a University of Minnesota, you know, with campus, broad campus, try to um, work in a systems-oriented approach to their entity, mm -hmm. you know, with everybody kind of on board, you know, one guru sort of, you know, managing all this. I can even see a community that was being brought up new or something, you know, sharing resource resources and you know the dry cleaners working with so and so, you know, all. but it's hard to picture all those companies working together on a project. I can't, I can't, I can't. It doesn't compute that mm -hmm. how it works. It's not going to be easy. So. A few, a few things with that. One, um, that group partnering together. One thing that we, we've said from day one within the coalition is all of the members have to support the vision. They all have to, to support where we want to go. But none of them have to participate in any one of the actions. So anything that we do together won't require all 33 members to say, yes, I will participate in that action, as long as they all support the the, the way that we get there ultimately. So that could result in a small project between three or four companies that have an interest in, say, community gar gardening. So providing uh, more local agriculture to provide healthy food for schools, maybe. So three companies could maybe partner on, on that kind of pilot project to really develop a, uh, or advance even our already robust community garden system that we have here in Minneapolis um, to maximize it and help schools have healthy food, food wastes that turn into compost, goes back into the system. So a small, more circular system. And that could be a project with the coalition without requiring everybody to participate. And at the same time, we could have 10 other members that want to work on some energy-related policy work where they, as a, a smaller group within the coalition, could advocate for something around the renewable energy standard or something else. So it's going to require a lot of smaller collaborations within the bigger collaboration, but it's going to take a lot of effort because it's still going to be very difficult for even three of those large companies to have the exact same priorities and the same ideas of how they get there, um, which is why it's going to take a lot of time, too. We've been at it for about a year, and we don't actually have project that we can point to that we've done, but we made a lot of progress in figuring out where we're going to do, where we're, we're what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. You can see, like, um, oftentimes, um, the, like, a power plant will be on a river. I mean, I'm not going to say it's a good thing, but power plants on rivers, and uh, paper mill is right there, too. Mm -hmm. So using the same, you know, heat and so forth. And they sort of cooperate, they work together uh, in, a, in an efficient way. And I can see companies working like that mm -hmm. in a synergistic way in terms of use of resources Absolutely. and energy. Yeah, and it'll require hundreds and hundreds of those those smaller examples to get us anywhere close to the field. And it'll take a lot of time, too. Barbara's just saying the paper mill owns the power plant. Yeah, thank you. Along that same idea, one possibility would be for the companies who have a waste could be folks could perhaps have a uh, a listing of inputs mm -hmm. where they could have you could have a free choice menu of what's available and other companies could pick and choose as a what might be useful for them. Mm -hmm. And then to the earlier issue of uh, advocacy, perhaps it's the success stories that your projects generate that can be used as support for advocacy organizations. Absolutely. And again, since collaboration is at the key of this, at the, at the core of this, we're going to look to all types of organizations that can 
both help us get to our vision, but also can benefit from the work that the coalition is doing. So whether it's success stories, or I mentioned trying to demonstrate our collective voice, that's kind of where the, the advocacy of the policy-based work is right now, just showing that what this group wants and what their collective demand is, especially around energy, and trying to use that in a way, whether it's through the coalition or through partners, other advocacy organizations, to use that kind of information to make a difference. Is there a continuing voice effort back to those 33 individual companies that represents what the coalition has done, so the people that work at those companies are aware of what their company's membership has done in, in the sense that all 33 groups of employees get the same message and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say, the, the, the voice that uh, what this accomplishment has, has, has made. That's actually a core component of our, our overarching work plan for this year is to better engage the entire company in this, this process and in this work because we, we have some incredibly dedicated individuals and, and teams of individuals at all of these companies. But, but 3M is an example. That's a giant company. We want to make sure that it's more than just some of their sustainability teams and staff that are working on this, that it's actually a company process that they're bought into this. And that's a, a major component of what we're going to do this year, is try to better engage the entire company, especially the season to make a lot of those decisions. And one thing you mentioned earlier was uh, that there was uh, the money coming from um, from uh, Volkswagen, which sounds pretty great. Um, but one of my concerns is: is there? A, do we know that it will be earmarked and not allowed to be just absorbed into the general funds um, when it comes to Minnesota? Well, again, I am not the expert on that, so I can't tell you a whole lot. Um, Bill from our office will be the person. Answer it all in detail. I can say that I don't think it's all been determined, not only of where it gets spent, but even just how it gets spent. Um, I know the PCA is still working right now on that process of figuring out how they allocate all these funds and where it goes and who it goes through. So I think, I forget the timeline, but I think in the, over the course of the next month, two months, we're supposed to get more information on what just that process is supposed to be and how that money is spent. They've, they've had two meetings so far, and they've got another one in Northern Minnesota coming up next week, I think. So we're working toward that. Yeah. More and more. Yeah. Cool. One more question, please. Yeah. I've got a question about this, this stove swap. Mm -hmm. are, are they uh, replacing wood burning stoves with, and wood's renewable energy with natural gas, which is not? Uh, no, it's it's wood. I believe, and again, this is my part. I believe it's 100% uh, still the wood. So it's replacing old wood stoves with either new wood stoves or uh, biomass pellet stoves. So it's still going to be renewable. It's not going to be natural gas. It's not going to be fossil fuel at all. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. I can I can verify that. Just you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's it's. I know the focus is on either pellets or wood. If I could add, the EPA has standards for new wood stoves, and they very often include airtight construction of the burning chamber, outside air, and then a catalytic converter, which will convert uh, and consume more of the, the, the gas, the, the smoke before it goes out the chamber. Let's get another hand. Please. 